The approach from the beginning is going to make all the difference. You're not our enemy any more than you are ours. We're in this to hopefully work together and do what is best for the children. You're listening to the Texas Family Law Insiders Podcast, your source for the latest news and trends in family law in the state of Texas. Now here's your host, Attorney Holly Draper. We're excited to welcome Bo Bowen today to the Texas Family Law Insiders Podcast. Bo was born and raised in Texas and was the first in his family to receive a post-secondary education. He graduated magna cum laude from Sam Houston State University with a Bachelor of Arts in Speech Communication and History. He graduated from Thurgood Marshall School of Law in Houston in 2013. Today, Bo is the managing partner of the Bowen Law Firm, PLLC in Houston. He is licensed to practice in the state of Texas and is a certified mediator, family mediator, and arbitrator that offers services in all alternative dispute resolution matters. Bo is also a member of the prestigious Texas Bar College. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me and I appreciate the introduction. So can you start out by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yes, ma'am. My name is Bo Bo Bowen and I am a family man. I actually created my law firm so I can ensure that I had time with my family, which sort of makes sense why I offer family laws. I believe there's nothing more important than family. How did you get started in family law? Oddly enough, when I went to law school, I had no intention of practicing family law. I didn't take the class. I didn't prep for it on the bar. But sure enough, the first client that walked through my doors was a family client. And we haven't turned back. We've been helping them ever since. I thought I was going to do uniform commercial code and things like that, but it turns out this is more exciting. I was exactly the same way. I had zero interest in doing family law when I was in law school, didn't take the class, thought, why would you want to get messed up in people's business like that? And when I started my own practice, I felt like I had to take whatever walk through the door. And family law cases started coming through the door. And what I had wanted to do originally was to be a litigator. But I realized pretty quick that at litigation firms, you don't get to do a whole lot of litigating. (laughs) And that was one of the things that drew me to family law originally was quicker pace, get to be in the courtroom a lot more, but also that you truly get to help people and make a difference. You're absolutely right. And for me, it's actually helped my marriage. I hear in and out the mistakes that husbands and wives make. I don't make as many now because of it. It's also helped me appreciate my wife because she is crazy. Don't get me wrong, but she's not that crazy. And I'm blessed. Yes, it definitely makes you appreciate what you have, for sure. I agree. So can you describe how you got to be where you are today? I'm making a lot of wrong choices, to be fair. Uh, I'm actually a high school dropout. I did not take the most direct route to get here. I went to serve in the military as well. They helped straighten me out when my dad failed, which is hard to say considering he was a Pentecostal preacher and a Marine Corps general instructor. He did his best to keep me on a tight line. I didn't stand to it. So uh, coincidentally, I got ran by trial and error. And I always wanted to be an attorney, but I did not know what it took. I, I didn't even know you actually had to go to undergraduate to go to law school first. That's how far off I was from even picking the right path to start. So I don't encourage people to follow my route. <laughs> Take the easier path, right? Please, yeah, they'll be much happier. I learned a lot. I'm able to connect with a lot of my clients and the jurors because I've had a lot of those different jobs working the way through. But outside of that, there's such an easier route to get there. Listen to your parents. They do know better. Mine did too. <laughs> so how would you describe your current practice? I hate to say a general practice, but I want to say it's more family-centered because pretty much everything that a family would need aside from immigration or criminal law, we offer. I mean, the whole gamut of family, you know, divorce without kids, enforcements, modifications, my favorite being adoptions. We also offer wills and trusts, you know, estate planning, and of course, probate when it's time to put those wills and trusts into place, in addition to the full gamut of civil litigation, like breach of contract, things of that nature. And we just started offering personal injury. All right. Well, that's quite a, quite a repertoire y'all have, but is this family law take up a big portion of your practice? Yes, ma'am. I'd say family law is a good 50 to 60% of the practice. The other 40% is the outliers, such as estate planning, probate, civil litigation, and personal injury. Personal injury by far is the smallest segment. The, the good, I'd say 30% of that would then be estate planning and probate. But the overwhelming majority is definitely family law. All right. So today we brought you here. We're going to discuss the roles of different attorney appointments that we may see in our family law cases, specifically amicus attorneys, guardians ad litem, and attorneys ad litem. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with those types of attorney appointments? 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, one, I've worked with them all in those capacities. We had cases that would apply, and I've also served in all those capacities myself. So I've actually had both sides of it. What are the key differences between an amicus attorney, a guardian ad litem, and an attorney ad litem? Thank you. That's a great question. Well, I'm going to start with an amicus attorney. And the focus of an amicus attorney is to provide legal services to the court, while the focus of an attorney ad litem is to provide legal services to a person. So again, an amicus, amicus attorney or an AA is an attorney appointed by the court in a, usually a private law, private law family case. It is their role to provide legal services necessary to assist the court in protecting a person's best interest. An example would be that an amicus, amicus attorney might be appointed in your case, assuming the court needed to assist in protecting normally the best interest of a child. But it's not limited to a child. It can also be someone who is incapacitated. It does depend on the court's needs. But in that situation, the amicus then would have a conversation with you, your child, and any other parties involved. They're going to make home visits, interview other people with knowledge of the case, such as teachers, doctors, and relatives. They're going to attend hearings and mediation. And then they add the amicus would then use that information to make a recommendation to the court about what is best for the child or the person representing. In my experience, it's normally a minor. So again, if the amicus is appointed in your case, it's important to understand that the amicus attorney does not, let me say it again, does not represent you or the child. And so neither one is their interest. The interest is to help the court. So you need to keep that in mind. When you have an amicus, you are not the client. Versus an attorney ad litem, on the other hand, when they're appointed to provide legal services to a person and they're supposed to actually advocate for their wishes. Now, whether the client is a parent or a child, the ad litem will owe this person complete loyalty, confidentiality in all communications, and diligent, competent representation. That is not the same in an amicus. Again, the amicus is focused more helping the court. And that brings us to a guardian ad litem, the last person, or a GAL, which is by far most common, in my opinion, in CPS cases, but they do go outside of that. You can find under Texas Family Code 107 that cover each of these people. It gives you more information regarding the three. But a guardian ad litem, according to Texas Family Code 107.001, subsection 5, it means that a person is appointed to represent the best interest of the child again. And it doesn't have to be a lawyer. An amicus is an amicus curry, or Latin for what is called friend of the court. That's a beautiful title. You're not going to get that title anywhere else in the law. So <laughs> enjoy it while you got it. But again, they do the best interest of the child. Like it doesn't have to be a lawyer. It can be a volunteer advocate, a non-attorney licensed professional, such as a counselor or a social worker, or actually any adult whom the court determines to be competent. They can then qualify them arguably to serve as a guardian ad litem. In CPS cases, a lot of time you see that through a company called CASA, a court appointed special advocates. I've worked with them intensively and they have a very important job. Attorneys can also be appointed to the dual role of an attorney ad litem and a guardian ad litem. But anytime there's a conflict, you got to ask to have a guardian ad litem come in if you're the attorney. But again, all this is outlined under Texas Family Code 107. And that's usually the best place to start regarding their duties and whatnot. Do attorneys need any types of certifications to receive those appointments? That we actually do now, not as a guardian ad litem, from my experience, but as the I'm sorry, as the guardian ad litem and as the attorney ad litem, you do. But I didn't, I don't remember having one for the amicus occur because again, you know, they can appoint who they like, in my opinion, it's easy a list anyway. But for a GAL and the AAL, typically you do, yes, ma'am. It's an easy class. A lot of bar associations offer for free. The Houston Bar Association did it a couple of years ago, I know Waller did it last year. It takes less than a day, $25. You complete it to the state bar and then they end up certifying you so you can take these types of cases. Is that something that you have to take on an annual basis if you want those appointments or is it one and done? It's normally once every two years and once you've had that thing for at least five, then it ups it to a renewing every four years after that. But it's at least at a minimum every two to start. And it, it, there's a process to keep going back. The state wants their money too. So they charge for those classes, the CLEs that get this qualification typically. So you mentioned earlier about guardian ad litems possibly being a non-attorney, be that a CASA yeah. or therapist or whoever the court deems is appropriate to be the guardian ad litem. But I would assume those people haven't necessarily taken any training because they're not attorneys. So is it just an attorney serving as a guardian ad litem that has to be trained and there's no requirement for certification for non-attorneys? Well, from my experience with CASA, they were trained, but they were trained through CASA. 
the court appointed special advocates and they had their own boxes to check. And normally once they had done that were presented to the court and then the court would appoint CASA and then they designated those people once they had the training. I do not know if it's the same training because I'm not sure as an attorney, but I do know they do have some base training to help with that. And I know I've had judges in cases randomly appoint a therapist or somebody like that as a guardian of item to try and help sort through what's going on in the case. But there was never any discussion about the certification or is this person qualified? They were just appointed. Well, the guardian ad litem, the court does have, in my opinion, its opinion to say, I want this person to know whether or not they have the adequate training. If they determine in their own, the court, that they're competent to qualify, in my opinion, they're allowed to designate them as a guardian ad litem. So different rules, the court can do things that we can't. But it generally, in my opinion, if an attorney is serving that role, they're going to have that certificate of training through the state that says they at least can do this. Right. And it's Usually. only actually the training is for guardianships, which is odd, even though we're serving <laughs> as an attorney ad litem. It's weird. I've, I've noticed that in the past where it doesn't seem to have anything to do with representing children in CPS litigation or anything like that. It doesn't. Every <laughs> training I've had, and I've gone through it at least five times, nothing really applies to the, actually the ad litem for the children. That's where we have to go back to the Texas Family Code and look under those sections to see what they're supposed to do and not to do. Which again, that's Texas Family Code 107. All right. So let's start out, go a little bit deeper on the amicus attorney. So what types of cases should an attorney consider requesting an amicus from the court? Yes, ma'am. As we stated before, an amicus attorney is an attorney, of course, appointed by the court in a pri typically a private law case. And their roles provide legal services necessary to assist the court in protecting the person's best interest. Now, for an example, an amicus might be appointed in a case that the court feels they need assistance in protecting the best interest of your child. I have noticed the courts don't normally want to make this decision on their own, so it's not uncommon for them to appoint an amicus attorney to help them make that decision, in addition to asking for a social worker to come in to do what's called a home study. And then normally what I've seen, when you've got the amicus attorney and you've got the home study, the social worker, they're normally in line. And when that happens is they're either going to be with you or they're going to be against you. So it's either you got one against three or you're three against one. You often see the odds as well as I can how that can help out the case. So in Houston, do you see that fairly often to have both an amicus and a child custody evaluation? I have had him several times on our own. It also depends on if there's any money in the estate. The court is not going to appoint this. If there's no one to pay these people. So usually when I don't ask for those things, we have that type of fights because we don't have the funds for it. But fortunately, we have something called the DRO in Houston that can do things based on income, which can help offset some of that. But when you have two parents who are working off minimum wage, it doesn't matter. They ain't going to have the money for it. At which point, then the court has to roll up his sleeve. And ideally, the kids over 12 can do some in-chamber interviews and such to help. But otherwise, no, then we're just on our own. In my practice, it was just obviously up in the Dallas area as opposed to the Houston area. But I have never seen both an amicus and a custody evaluation done in the same case. We will often request one or the other. I usually see an amicus as a quicker, less expensive route than a custody evaluation. But I can find it's sort of certain judges prefer an amicus, certain judges prefer a custody evaluation, and it's helpful to know what your particular judge has a preference for. A good attorney knows the law, a great attorney knows the judge. <laughs> and so with that, we'll typically ask for both, and the court wants to give them, we will. If they don't, we'll pick one of them. By asking for both, we'll get one of the two. But you're right, they don't normally always do it, but there's money for it, and I can stack the deck. I'm going to stack the deck in my favor. If I can get three against one against you, I'm going to take that. So when should an attorney consider requesting a guardian ad litem? Well, here's how I've played the game in the past. So if I know what the child wants and say child wants to go with my client, the dad, right? Or the mom in this case, I'm going to ask actually not even for a GAL. I'm asking for an ad litem because I'm not supposed to push what the child wants, not the best interest. And then if I know, say that I represent dad and they want to go with mom, well, then I'm going to ask for the amicus because the amicus will take into consideration, of course, what the kid wants, but that is no, that's not the main priority. They still look at the best interest. So it does depend on your case, in my opinion, on how you want to approach it. But keep in mind, again, a guardian ad litem or Texas Family Code 1071, subsection 5, it means that a, part, a person that's appointed to represent the best interest of the child, then it's dangerous. The same with the amicus. It's not always about the best interest. It, is, it differs from what you need. You gotta ask for what helps your case. So I base it on my case. And anytime I have some sort of big dispute between the parties, I let them know that there's a big potential. This person's gonna come in. They're paying for it, and here's what they're gonna do. 
And if it looks like it'll help me more than hurt, then they can afford it, we'll ask for it. And if not, then I don't. So it is a case by case. And in so many cases in family law, a lot of the evidence that the parties have comes from the children. And you can almost never actually get that into evidence. So it can be really helpful having one of these court appointments who can actually talk to the child and get that information as a way of getting that factored in to the court's decision. What's really good about these two people is that they don't have any dog in the race. They don't really care who wins or loses this. They're supposed to enter it, clean hands, no biases, look at the big picture and truly recommend what is best for these kids. And everything goes right, it actually, more often than not, it does work out that way. We don't always like their answers, but more often than not, the people do do their jobs. We also have some that get a little more crazy, like the runaway amicuses, <laughs> and good luck controlling them. He's got to eject, 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 and get ready to appeal. I, I, I've dealt with that myself. You just have to do your best, but there's are times it can bite you in the butt. Yeah, usually if we're going to request an amicus, we have our list of people that we know have served as amicus before and we trust their judgment and we think, you know, they're not going to be the runaway amicus. And so we'll specifically request one of those people to avoid that exact problem. It sounds like y'all agree more in Dallas than we do in Houston. <laughs> if we don't get an agreement, the court's going off their list and we don't know who it's going to be. And that's what happened the last two times we've done this. I don't know what it is about family law and people trying to fight. It is nowhere near as cutthroat as it is my civil practice, meaning uh, estate planning, probate. Thing. I don't understand why family law is that way. Doesn't have so, to be. Earlier, you mentioned something about a dual role between a guardian yes. ad litem and an attorney ad litem. What is a dual role situation? Can you kind of explain that a little bit more for everyone? That only happens in smaller counties, but even now the smaller ones are adopting costs and such to do it. This happened more when I was serving in Waller County with Judge Endell. Great judge. Uh, anyway, I, he took me under his wing and really helped me out when I first started practicing many years ago. And that's actually how I cut my teeth was on CPS cases with his guidance. So sometimes, again, smaller counties, they can't afford, don't have enough volunteers. So they'll serve in the dual role, whereas the guardian ad litem and whereas the attorney ad litem. The problem is there are times that what the child wants is not in their best interest. I apologize for the example, but it's the easiest way to make this point clear, and it's happened. I said we have a little girl who was abused by their guardian. It could be a mom or a dad. The child now wants to return to that guardian. We know that is not the child's best interest, but I'm now in the dual capacity. What do I do? I can't advocate for that. I know that's not what's best for her. So when, those, when he has those types of conflicts, it's when you ask the court to separate the two and then you're gonna appoint someone else as a guardian of so you can truly push and do your job as the attorney of the and then they'll come in and argue why they should. That way you can keep everything right with your client. So that's I the most to, extreme version. I used to do uh, CPS appointments in Dallas and we would see attorneys appointed in a dual role all the time in Dallas. And it always concerned me that if you realize there's a conflict along the way and you have to request an appointment because of it, well, now the judge automatically knows that you think what the child wants is not in their best interest. So otherwise you wouldn't yes. be requesting it. That's true. It does tip them off, but there's no other way to do it. That, that's, that's as I understand it. It is what it is, but at least you can still then represent for what they want and hopefully not get it at that point. I know it's weird as an attorney to want to fight for your client and lose. But in those kinds of fights, that's why I'm really dependent on my cost arrest, my GALs to step up and put me down because I don't want to win this, but I still have to go and fight. It's a weird position to be in. It definitely is. And it's not unusual for children who have been in an abuse or neglect situation to want to return. And it may or may not be in their best interest, depending on the circumstances, obviously, but it's hard to see for sure. So with any of these court appointments that we've been talking about, be it an amicus or a GAL or an AAL, what role does that attorney play if you come down to having a bench trial? The roles are all the same. If you're the attorney on line, you're supposed to push for what that client wants. So if it's a minor, it could be a PlayStation. I've literally had them force me to go to court and ask the court for a PlayStation. Of course, we're not going to trial on that. But that, that's how extreme it is. You push what, even if it's something that's bad for them, for example, the young lady who wants to go back with her father who sexually abused her, her mother who sexually abused her. Obviously, that's not what's best for them. We still have to argue and do that. So you're going to do your job and you're going to present your case and everything else. And 
and they come back and go against you. So anytime you have that many parties, the GAL is not an attorney, that's a guardian litem. They're more of a witness in my opinion. They don't get to call witnesses, propound discovery, anything of that nature. That's reserved for people who have the attorneys in their name, like an amicus occurring, and then the attorney ad litem. So they're full attorneys. We get to propound discovery. We get to call witnesses. You get to object. I mean, we're, we're full in it versus, again, the guardian ad litem. They're more of a witness to be used, in my humble opinion, by the ad litem or the amicus. And, of course, the court can call them in on their own. But outside of that, that they can... They're submitting reports and all that. We don't do that as amicuses and the attorney ad litems. We are not to be used as witnesses. So there is definitely a difference in those roles. What if the guardian ad litem is an attorney? If they're serving in a dual role, if they're serving in a dual role, then it's the attorney ad litem role. In my opinion, they get to ask the questions and such. If you're serving as a GAL, you're still, then in that case, you are a witness, but then you cannot also be the attorney. You can't be both. You can't be a witness and the attorney. Unless, unless, there's always the one caveat, attorney's fees. Then, of course, we can testify and things that outside <laughs> of that we're not supposed to. And the only time I've seen a difference were tax cases. And that's where they had the, uh, the attorney allowed them to submit an affidavit. But outside of that one small realm, I don't see attorneys ever submitting those types of things as witnesses. I'm sure there's other areas I'm aware of, but as a general rule, we don't do that. So if an amicus attorney or attorney ad litem is not a witness, is not giving testimony, do they still have an opportunity to give their opinion, especially the amicus, to the court about what they believe is in the best interest? Yes, ma'am. In my opinion, they're also going to do that through witnesses, but they also can do an opening. They get to do a closing, so they get their time. They're a full-on attorney. Okay, so we talked about a bench trial, and you just mentioned a jury trial where you'd had an amicus involved. Is there any difference with these court appointments when you have a jury trial versus a bench trial? The jury does make other makes decisions regarding facts and the judge makes them regarding law. So yes, there's a bit of a split, but regarding the roles, no ma'am, it's just a difference in who you're trying to convince. But in the end, ultimately the judge is still gonna have their say. So you want everyone on your side. And it's just, a, again, a difference of who you're trying to convince at which time, but the judge is still there the whole time calling balls and strikes. They're gonna hear it all. And you still need them on your side. So in my opinion, not, not really. My approach to either a bench or jury in that regard hasn't changed significantly. Maybe I missed something on that, but no, ma'am, in my opinion, I don't treat them much different. What can an attorney do that's not a court-appointed attorney, but one of the other attorneys on the case, to help their clients put their best foot forward with the amicus or an ad litem? Well, I'm an advocate for document, document, document. And as we know, Texas is a one-party state. When in doubt, record, follow up with email, follow up with text. And I found when my people do that, it's much easier to keep the amicus in line, or if it's an ad litem for a CPS case, you want to communicate with them. You want to work with them as well, in my opinion, because it, once you get under that microscope, they're going to find things you may not want. And if you don't put yourself in that position, it's going to be easier on you. I always encourage people to win again, document, 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 record the phone calls if you can. There's all kinds of apps available. I personally like an app for an iPhone. It's called Tape A Call Pro. It's 11 bucks. And if you have an Android, there's another app called Call X, C A L L X, like X ray. Now, Tape of Call Pro is also available on Android. It came out recently. But what I like about Call X better is the fact that it can automatically record your calls. So you don't have to go and click and go through the study. It just does it automatically. It helps my clients that way. But again, I would encourage them to record any and all communications. And as soon as you're done with those phone calls, I want you to then text that person a follow up with what y'all just discussed or an email. And then by doing those, it's easy to show if you did what you're supposed to or not. And when I do that, I don't have the issues that we do. Right? Murphy's Law plays. When you don't do it, we'll need it. But if you do it, I won't. So I say do it so we don't need it. And of course, there when any... I say we don't need it, less, that means less work, means less fees, means less money they have to pay. It wins for everybody. So are there any ethical considerations attorneys need to worry about in communicating with an amicus or an ad litem outside of the presence of the other attorney or anything like that? Well, if you're represented by counsel and you have an amicus involved and ad litem and other things in the case, I recommend you do your communications with your attorney there. Why would you communicate with them directly? Now, there are times you're going to have home visits and as an ad litem, I can just show up. So can the amicus, things like that? They can't. Open the doors, get the camera rolling, call your attorney, see they come in with as well. It wasn't uncommon for me to go to my client's homes and be there for those visits, be it CPS, be it the ad litem or the amicus or the guardian ad litem. 
And here's what's crazy. If you have multiple kids, it can be multiple ad litems because if their interests conflict, they're going to appoint multiple ones. And now you got one more person in your life that can just pop in another blue as well. And you have to work with them. During that period of time, it is very stressful, but it's temporary. And that's why I keep explaining to my clients, it's this much time. It'll become this much time if you start making it difficult. So cooperate, simply do what you need to do, check the boxes and get them out of your life. Well, and I, so I, I meant more stuff. specifically, are there ethical concerns for us as attorneys in communicating with the amicus or the ad litem? In my opinion, you're going to treat as you would any other account. You're going to treat them like they're opposing counsels. Do your best to represent your client and also make sure you're being full disclosure for what you need to be disclosed. In terms of ethical wise, no man, we actually have immunity unless we truly violate it. So when it comes to immunity, all these three positions are immune under the Texas Family Code 107.009. Unless, I uh, say, uh, we're immune for, number one, recommendations made with opinions given in our official capacity, unless we did it with a conscious indifference or a reckless disregard to the safety of another, if we did it in bad faith or with malice, or we were grossly negligent or willfully wrongful. From my experience, people who serve in this capacity, this is not going to comply. When you're working as an attorney at Lightham or as an amicus or as a guardian at Lightham, you're typically doing it at a reduced rate or for free, at least from my experience it was. They're not going to do these things to you. Now, it doesn't mean they wouldn't, but if they did, this is how you get them liable. Outside of that, uh, no, ma'am, we're, we're protected. So any last tidbits of information about the, these court appointments, amicus, guardian ad litem, attorney ad litem, that you think it's important for family lawyers to understand? I would approach them open-minded. Don't come at them. Uh, uh, it's a fight from the beginning. Keep in mind, we're simply working on the problem just like you are too. So again, I recommend killing them with kindness. Don't come out swinging, trying to make their life difficult. All it's going to do is make it more difficult on you. So again, the approach from the beginning is going to make all the difference. You're not our enemy any more than you are ours. We're in this to hopefully work together and do what is best for the children. And if people can long keep that on the forefront and remember we're simply doing our jobs and ideally together to do what is best for these children, the rest of the BS usually falls to the side. I get we have to proffer and do stuff for our clients. I understand all that. But when you're one-on-one -on -one with the other counsel, there's no reason to pull those shenanigans and games. All it's going to do is alienate you from the other side and make it that much more difficult for y'all to come together. You didn't help your client then. You made it more expensive and more difficult. Your job is to come in and get them satisfaction the quickest and most reasonable way possible. Alienate the other side is not going to do that. And also keep in mind, we're people too. We have bad days just because you had one poor run in. Come back in that second time and still try to kill my kindness. I'm willing to bet you're going to be surprised with the reaction. See, at my firm, that's what we try to do. And if I hear something different, I can promise you I'll be getting on to my associates. But y'all are not the enemy. We're all in this together. And ultimately, the goal again is to do what's best for the child. And who can't want that? A better future for some of us. Right. I agree 100%. So, one last question that I like to ask all of my guests on the podcast is if you could give one piece of advice to young family lawyers, what would it be? Get a mentor. The Houston Bar Association does them. I'm sure Dallas has the same option too. Get out there and get with these people. They'll help you. And if you don't know, get your butt on Texas Bar CLE and join that. Become a member of the, uh, oh gosh, I've never not been one, of the trial, not trial lawyers college. I did that too. That was fantastic with Mr. Spence. It is the uh, Texas Bar College. Sorry, it slipped my mind. I use it all the time to get a membership at Texas Bar College. All right, pay the dues, do the double CLEs and get access to all that stuff. And here's what I found. Those geniuses like Mrs. King and all them who do these CLEs, call them. Don't actually answer questions about it. I've been shocked with the feedback I've gotten from these leaders of the state bar. They'll help you. Just be patient with them. They're busy too. Uh, nine out of 10 times when I call about those CLEs, have these questions, they've answered them and helped me. And if I'm still doing that at you know, eight, nine, 10 years, I'm gonna be doing it at 20. So there's no such thing as a dumb question. Get your think group all together and don't be scared to use those big wigs at the state bar. They'll help you. And I'm not exempt. I'm not a big wig. I'm no Heather King, nothing like that, but I hope to be someday. And I can help you with, give me a call. 713-574-7777. Set a time to speak with me. I'll do what I can to help too. We're again, we're all in this together. And I want the state bar to think of it more that way. Yes. I'm going to fight you in court, but it doesn't mean we can't have lunch at the end of it. 
Yeah, I, I've run into issues where clients want you to be super aggressive. They don't want you to be agreeable. They don't want you to, to work with opposing counsel. And we've essentially had to say, that's not the way we operate. If you want someone that operates that way, you can find another attorney, but our integrity is very important to us. And we are going to maintain that in all of our cases. Well, and that's one case we're working on. I'm gonna work with this attorney again. And then I, I did the same as you, I explained to him, oh, are you doing it? I said, I'll find him if that's what you want, but here's what's gonna happen with your fees. And then they go, oh, oh, oh. And then they realize you should be happy I'm getting along with opposing counsel because we're gonna get this done cheaper. The more I fight and push them, the more you're gonna to have to pay. And clients don't wanna pay us anymore. I've never met a client happy with their bill. No matter if we kick butt or not, they always wish it was cheaper. And I'm no different. If I can get it for cheaper, I want it cheaper. But sometimes you get what you pay for, right? That's absolutely true. Well, we're not cheap. Uh, that Our hourly rates are our hourly rates. I build what we build no matter what you make, but we do our best to save and such. And that's one of the ways we do it. By not attacking the opposing side and setting them off in the beginning. Why go right into it acting like you're going to a war? No. I'm not going to get this done with a simple conversation. The savings, as you know, can be hundreds of thousands of dollars when it's said and done. Well, and having those good relationships with opposing attorneys can help you reach agreements in cases where you otherwise might not be able to do it. And that is almost always going to be better for the client. I agree because you got it done sooner. If it gets done sooner, it got done cheaper. And also mentioned those attorneys may end up being judges someday. I'm hoping to run in 20 years myself. If I take them off too much, they're going to remember me on the bench. <laughs> this is true. But when you're on the bench, you have the power. It's the opposite way if, the, if you take them off and they end up on the bench, right? That's right. And so I think even with that aspect, it's, it's easier to kill everybody with kindness. If you're going to fight and have those kinds of issues, do it before the court. It's easy. And watch them normally behave themselves when they're from the judge anyway. <laughs> Agreed. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully our listeners got a lot of good information about the different kind of court appointments that they may see in their cases. And uh, look forward to meeting you in person someday. The Texas Family Law Insiders Podcast is sponsored by the Draper Law Firm. We help people navigate divorce and child custody cases and handle family law appellate matters. For more information, visit our website at www.draperfirm.com.